General audience number 100 of November 24th, 1982. We have analyzed Ephesians, and above all, chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, from the point of view of the sacramentality of marriage. We are now examining still the same text in the perspective of the words of the gospel. Christ's words to the Pharisees, see Matthew chapter 19, appeal to marriage as a sacrament or to the primordial revelation of God's salvific will and action at the beginning, in the very mystery of creation. In virtue of God's salvific will and action, man and woman united with each other in such a way as to become one flesh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, were at the same time destined to be united in truth and love as sons of God. See Gaudium et Spes, chapter 24, verse 3. Adoptive sons in the firstborn son, beloved from eternity. To such unity and such a communion of persons, according to likeness with the union of divine persons, see Gaudium et Spies 24.3, are dedicated Christ's words referring to marriage as the primordial sacrament and confirming that sacrament at the same time on the basis of the mystery of redemption. In fact, the original unity in the body of man and woman does not cease to shape man's history on earth, although it lost the lucid clarity of the sacrament of the sign of salvation, which it possessed at the beginning. When Christ, in the presence of his interlocutors in Matthew and Mark, see Matthew chapter 19 and, Ver and Mark chapter 10, confirms marriage as a sacrament instituted by the Creator at the beginning, when he accordingly requires its indissolubility, he thereby opens marriage to the salvific action of God, to the powers flowing from the redemption of the body, which help to overcome the consequences of sin and to build the unity of man and woman according to the Creator's original plan. Eternal plan. The salvific action, deriving from the mystery of redemption, takes into itself God's original sanctifying action in the very mystery of creation. The words of Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 9, referencing Mark chapter 10, verses 2 through 12, have at the same time a very expressive ethical eloquence. On the basis of the mystery of redemption, these words confirm the primordial sacrament and at the same time establish an adequate ethos that we called ethos of redemption in our earlier reflections. In its theological essence, the evangelical and Christian ethos is the ethos of redemption. We can certainly find a rational interpretation for this ethos, a philosophical interpretation of a personalistic sort. Nevertheless, in its theological essence, it is an ethos of redemption. Even better, an ethos of the redemption of the body. Redemption becomes at the same time the basis for understanding the particular dignity of the human body, which is rooted in the personal dignity of man and woman. The reason for the dignity is precisely what stands at the root of the indissolubility of the conjugal covenant. Christ appeals to the indissoluble character of marriage as the primordial sacrament, and by confirming this sacrament on the basis of the mystery of redemption, at the same time draws from its conclusions of an ethical nature. Quote, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if the woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Mark chapter 10 verses 11 to 12. One can say that in this way, redemption is given to man as the grace of the new covenant with God in Christ. And at the same time, it is assigned to him as ethos, as the form of morality that corresponds to the action of God in the mystery of redemption. If marriage as a sacrament is an efficacious sign of God's salvific plan from the beginning, then at the same time, in the light of the words of Christ meditated upon, this sacrament is also an exhortation addressed to man, male and female, that they might conscientiously share in the redemption of the body. Sacrament, given as grace and assigned as an ethos. The ethical dimension of the redemption of the body shows its outlines with particular depth when we meditate on the words Christ spoke 
in the Sermon on the Mount about the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, who uh, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. Previously, we commented at length on this lapidary statement by Christ in the conviction that it has a fundamental significance for the whole theology of the body, above all in the dimension of historical man. And although these words do not refer directly and immediately to marriage as a sacrament, nevertheless, it is impossible to separate them from the whole sacramental substratum, in which, as far as the conjugal covenant is concerned, man's existence as male and female has been set both in the original context of the mystery of creation and also later in the context of the mystery of redemption. This sacramental substratum always concerns concrete persons. It penetrates into what man and woman are, or rather, into who the man and woman are, in their own original dignity as image and likeness of God due to creation and at the same time in the same dignity inherited despite sin, which is continuously assigned to man as a task through the reality of redemption. Christ, who in the Sermon on the Mount gives his own interpretation of the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, an interpretation constitutive of the new ethos, with the same lapidary words, assigns the dignity of every woman as a task to every man. At the same time, although this conclusion follows only indirectly from the text, he assigns also the dignity of every man to every woman. Finally, he assigns to each, both to the man and to the woman, his or her own dignity. In some sense, the sacrum of the person, specifically with respect to the person's femininity or masculinity, with respect to the body. It is, also, it is not difficult to show that Christ's words in the Sermon on the Mount are about ethos. <laughs> At the same time, it's not difficult to affirm after deeper reflection that such words flow from the very depth of the redemption of the body. Although they do not refer directly to marriage as a sacrament, it is not difficult to observe that they reach their own and full meaning in relation with the sacrament, both with the primordial sacrament, which is united with the mystery of creation, and with the one in which historical man, after sin and due to his hereditary sinfulness, must find again the dignity and holiness of conjugal union in the body on the basis of the mystery of redemption. In the Sermon on the Mount, as also in the dialogue with the Pharisees about the indissolubility of marriage, Christ speaks from the depth of that divine mystery. At the same time, he penetrates into the very depths of the human mystery. For this reason, he appeals to the heart, to that intimate place in which good and evil, sin and justice, concupiscence and holiness fight each other in man, speaking about concupiscence, about the concupiscent look, See Matthew chapter 5, verse 28. Christ makes his listeners aware that everyone carries within himself, together with the mystery of sin, the inner dimension of the man of concupiscence, which is threefold. Concupiscence of the flesh, concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. Precisely to this man of concupiscence, there is given in marriage the sacrament of redemption as grace and sign of the covenant with God, and it is assigned to him as an ethos. At the same time, in relation to marriage as a sacrament, it is assigned as ethos to every man, male and female. It is assigned to his heart, to his conscience, to his looks, and to his behavior. Marriage, according to Christ's words, see Matthew chapter 19, verse 4, is a sacrament from the beginning itself. And at the same time, on the basis of man's historical sinfulness, it is a sacrament that arose from the mystery of the redemption of the body.